Good evening, everyone. God bless you. It's uh, <clears throat> Thursday night at seven o'clock in Little Rock, Arkansas. I want to welcome everyone. I appreciate having the opportunity to to um, meet with you on these Thursday night broadcast. I uh, appreciate all of those that uh, are willing to consider the things that you know we have to say and and um, appreciate the church here in Little Rock, Arkansas. I've been talking here lately about the fact that we've had a we had a water break underneath our parking lot, our paved parking lot, and so we had quite an ordeal to get it fixed. But I want to publicly thank Brother Roy Durham here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, you know our assembly. He is a master plumber and his son um, Matthew Durham who's a journeyman plumber and uh, they really headed up the project and without them I don't know what we would have done but anyway them and the good men in the Little Rock Assembly worked together and got it done got it you know got our water uh, situated again now we have permanent water we were having to turn it off because we had an underground water leak having to turn it off every service till we got things ready to switch over to the new service. So anyway, we got it done. I'm so thankful for these brethren. They're faithful to work and help us. So praise God. It's, uh, uh, you know, we're living in a good day. You know, I, I know that we're all, um, you know, this COVID uh, shut-in. <laughs> And, and uh, you know, having to be so careful with the mask and spacing, I think is just about getting on it, about to get to a point that people about to get, uh, you know, like, I don't know, shut in fever or something, you know. And and uh, I think every once in a while you're just going to have to shake it off and, and do what the Bible says. Look to the hills from which cometh your help. Your help comes from the Lord. Uh, you know, we're serving a great God and, and this, this time that we're facing right now, will it will pass. We, God will get us past it. And, uh, you know, there's, there is a lot of speculation. There's a lot of things that we know that we are considering concerning, uh, you know, the word of God and the end of the Gentile world. We know that uh, we're looking at those things and considering them and the time in which we're living. But, um, you know, I, I think from time to time, we need to look a little bit on the brighter side of things and just stop for a minute and be thankful for the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. We have uh, so such a wonderful blessing of what God has done for the body of Christ now well over a hundred years where we are, um, you know, the, the Lord, um, I, I know that the, you know, if we look at it, how that the early church or the New Testament church, the church we read about in the New Testament, so many people don't really realize that that church did fall away and that God did harvest that world. You remember Jesus, I've said it many times, how he told his disciples one day, he said, say not, it's four months till the harvest for the, the fields are white and ready to harvest. Uh, we don't get a lot more information about that, but it, the indication is, is that it was four months before harvest and the fields were green as they could be and it wasn't anywhere close to time for harvest. And Jesus was telling them, don't say that because what I'm seeing is a white, a field of white, uh, you know, when, when, when uh, wheat harvest, when it gets time to harvest wheat, it turns white, it turns, you know, it comes to a full um, uh, fruit 
and uh, fruition. And, and, uh, but it, uh, up until then, until it comes to harvest time, it's just, it's green. It's just like green grass. It's beautiful, but it's not ready, certainly not ready for harvest. But I'm just bringing that scripture up to remind you that, you know, the, the word harvest in, uh, in the New Testament uh, wasn't something that was uh, um, foreign to those people. Um, let me see if I could just give you a, a scripture here or so. Um, the scripture I just gave you is in Luke 10 and 2, where Jesus said, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is ripe. Oh, this is another scripture. This is not the one that's in John, the one I was uh, quoting. But here he said, The harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore for the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into the harvest. And he said, you know, I mentioned this in John 4, 35, where he said, say not, there's the four months, and then comes the harvest. Oh, holy. he said, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Well, the indication is there that it wasn't, <laughs> it was still four months to harvest, but he was talking about something spiritually in a prophetical time uh, timetable. And um, so, uh, you know, and, and again, the reason, the point that I'm bringing out here is, is that it was, uh, that there was a harvest in the end of that world. And so uh, they, God did harvest the end of the G Jewish world, and he's going to harvest again here in Revelations 14 and 15, uh, it states, uh, and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. See, uh, if you look at that, um, uh, first in the 14th verse, it says, I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle that grown golden crown showed him that he was the king and ruler uh he was on a white cloud that represents a a righteous white is a color for righteousness a cloud is a a, a heavenly place it's up in the heavenly place that's a restored church and one set like the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. That's what he reaped the earth with. That's what they reaped back then in the fields when they were ready to harvest of barley or wheat. They cut those fields down with a sickle, a hand sickle. They didn't have uh, combines like we have today in our technology and and. Uh, gasoline motor driven apparatus or, or machinery uh, but they had a sickle that they uh, that they reaped with they cut down the fields you know they still do that over in the Dominican Republic the Dominican Republic's main uh, uh, export is sugar and they have literally thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres of sugar. And it grows year round over there. They they do rotate the fields, but they still uh, cut down sugar cane with sickles. They still have oxen that pulls, they cut the sugar cane, the sugar cane down, they pile it on carts that oxen pull, pulls, and they have, they do have uh, box cars, just just a, uh, uh, it's a wired uh, mm, box around a, a flat box car on trains, 
and they fill those. They they have those oxen pull up to those trains. They fill those each car with sugar cane, and um, anyway, then they haul it back to the sugar cane factory where they they uh, cook the sugar and and make sugar uh, out of it. Uh, anyway, and I don't know anything about that. I just know they do it. I, I, you know, you certainly smell it when it's, uh, when they're, and they do it. Like I said, they do it year round. I was over there. Um, I remember the first time I went there, I asked a, a lady there, she had a, a pot on her patio and she had uh, tomato plants in it. She had one one pot that had uh, okra plant in it. I said, when do you, when do you grow tomatoes over here? She said, when do you want tomatoes? You could grow them anytime. <laughs> of course, the Dominican Republic is a tropical island, tropical climate. And so they can, they can grow anything just about any time over there. I mean, it, there is certain seasons for, uh, some of their fruit trees and, you know, like avocados and, mangoes and there's there's certain times of the year that those trees will produce but a lot of things vegetables you can grow out of the ground anytime because it's always uh it's always warm enough. they're close enough to the sun to to uh, cause the earth to be warm enough and uh, they have enough rain all the time to to uh, produce anyway uh here it says uh, and the angel uh, said, uh, thrust in thy sickle. Uh, verse 15, and reap for the time has come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. So I'm just showing you that contrast of scriptures that there was a harvest time in the early church and there's a harvest time in the um, end of the Gentile world, which we know we are partly down in that. Uh, I've, I've showed the church this here, but I'm, I may mention it again uh, just because of those that listen and then it never gets old for me to tell it again, so I hope it don't get old for me to for you to hear some of the things again. Um, in the fifth chapter of James, I want to I want to read this, and I want you to understand. In fact, I'm going to go back to the first chapter of James, uh, just to read that first verse to you before we go to the fifth chapter. Um, James 1 and 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. I just wanted to read that to show you that James wrote this letter to the Jews, the 12 tribes of the Jews. This wasn't Paul writing to the Gentile churches, but this was the pastor of Jerusalem writing to the churches um, in uh, in, among the 12 tribes of the Jews. And in the fifth verse, he's, fifth chapter, first verse, he said, uh, well, let's see, let's maybe we can start down a little bit lower than that. Um, Hold on just a minute. Let me find the scripture that I want to give you. Um, my, I'm on my computer and it, it jumped to Peter instead of James. So give me just a second. Um, I'll give you the verse that I'm wanting. It's James, the fifth chapter, and 
the let's just start uh, maybe in the first verse. Say, go to now, you men, uh, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You've heaped treasures together for the last days. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You've nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. He's James is really uh, speaking words of judgment to the 12 tribes of Israel um, because they rejected the Messiah. They rejected Christ. And of course, he's also dealing with any of those among the the body of Christ that are rebellious or troublemakers. But look what he says in verse seven. It said, be ye patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. That, that's, uh, I wanted to bring that out, that he's showing that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. He tells them to be patient because uh, the, the, the um, husbandman, which is the Lord, for the waited for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. He was telling the 12 tribes back there that the Lord's coming was soon. It, in contrast, if you didn't know the Bible well enough to understand what was going on, you would think the Bible contradicted itself. If you go to Second Thessalonians, and again, I know that the people here uh, have heard me talk on this, so this isn't something new to everybody, but I still, still think we all can get uh, more out of things the more we rehearse them. Anyway, so uh, in in Second Thessalonians, in the second second chapter, Paul is telling. Now he's talking to the Gentiles, and these are. You know, this is different than the Jews. He's talking to Gentile people. James was talking to Jews. James was saying the Lord's coming soon. He's telling that the Lord waited patiently for the precious fruit of the early and latter rain. I was just talking to you about the harvest that took place back there and the harvest that's going to take place down here. In the 14th chapter, the whole 14th chapter of the book of Revelation is talking about a harvest in the end of the Gentile world. What James was talking about was the harvest in the end of the Jewish world. Now, Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica, he was only there two Sabbath days, two, two Sabbaths, talked in the temple, he got run out of town. He sent Timothy back there. Uh, they sent letters and asking questions. He answered questions in the first uh, epistle that he wrote to the Thessalonians. And then he answered questions also uh, concerning the coming of the Lord. Uh, look in, in uh, first two, I mean, chapter two, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. 
Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Well, <clears throat> here, one, uh, here's another apostle stating, now concerning the coming of the Lord, don't let anybody shake. Don't you be shaken by anything anybody says for that day is not coming until there be a falling away first. I will tell you that most of the Christian world preachers, I, I'm not, I, you know, um, I haven't kept up with all of them across the board, so I don't want to put this on everybody, but I will say that many years ago when I was out there among Babylon, uh, the different organizations, most preachers taught that this falling away didn't take place till down here. And still many preachers teach that there is a coming of falling away in the end of the Gentile world. In the body of Christ, we, we actually teach the opposite of that. We teach that the greatest thing, the greatest time has yet to come. I had a question, uh, somebody questioned me about Brother John Butt before he passed away. He was teaching and he taught that the, uh, that uh, the best was yet to come. He, he mentioned that in a Bible study. Somebody asked me, what did Brother Bud mean by that? I said, he meant that there's going to be a restored church in the end of the Gentile world that is going to restore the church back to the place that the New Testament church was in. We'll have a church like that church and we will produce what they produce. There will be a harvest in the end of our world like there was a harvest back there, but it will take a, a restored church to produce that. Right now in the body of Christ, we are still working on, we're working on establishing the truth about different subjects. Let me stop here for a minute and just mention that I want you to be encouraged about the body of Christ. Uh, I want you to be encouraged about the fact that what God has done in, in bringing about uh, the Reformation, even though this falling away did take place in the end of the Jewish world, when God finished that harvest, God turned to another people, the Gentiles. And God brought several in, beginning with the house of Cornelius. He, uh, if you remember how that Peter, the, the angel sent uh, told Cornelius to send men to, to Simon the Tanner's house and get a man by the name of Peter and have him come talk to him. That's when God talked to Peter about, you know, letting down this sheet full of uh, unclean animals and God telling him to rise and eat. That was That was just absolutely beyond what Peter could comprehend that God was telling him to do. I don't know if he felt like God was testing him or what. He said, Lord, you know that there's never an unclean thing entered my mouth. He kept the law. He kept the law of Israel, the, the uh, dietary law. There were many things they couldn't eat uh, under the law of Moses in their dietary law. God had a purpose for that. There's a type in all of it. But, uh, but here God was... He let this sheet down and took it back up, let it back down again. Each time he told Peter to eat it, well, at the same time, there was a knock on the door. Men said, we're here to talk to a man by the name of Simon, uh, Peter. And so they got him. He came down off the roof. He was up there having this vision and in prayer. And they said, our master 
you know, Cornelia sent us uh, to come get you and that an angel told him to have you come talk to us. So he went with them. And while he was there and he began to talk to them, and it wasn't even a, a, a thing uh, that was common for a Jew to go into a Gentile's house or have any kind of fellowship with them. But, uh, you know, no doubt he began to put it together that God was uh, getting him ready to talk to some Gentiles when he was telling them to eat of this unclean animals. And uh, while he was there talking to them, only God could have done this this way. Uh, while Peter was talking to Cornelius and his household, the spirit of God fell and those people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> idea that they could receive it, but they were in such awe that God gave them the Holy Ghost while Peter was talking to them about Jesus. Uh, he, you know, they said, well, can anybody forbid water that they, seeing they've received the same spirit of God that we receive? And so we say many times that that was, uh, you know, that that was, uh, that those babies were born breach, you know, they, they should have been baptized first, received the Holy Ghost, be ye baptized, repent every one of you, be ye baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Well, they received the Holy Ghost first, and then they had to be baptized, so they baptized them. But God started out with a, with a, the Gentile people, and of course, the he later called the apostle Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And I would say to you that that was our, that was the early reign to the Gentiles that when Paul began to plow up the Gentile fields and plant, plant seed before winter time, you know, and most of you know, but if you don't, Israel's uh, agricultural year started in in October, and that and then and and that's when they plowed up their fields and were rejoiced for the previous harvest of the year before, and then they plowed up their fields, planted seed, and the early rains, which was the fall rains, fell, and that's what happened in Paul's day. God blessed the the seed that. Paul planted among the Gentiles at before the falling away of the church, which would have been a type of winter. If you remember in the Songs of Solomon, I believe it's in the sixth chapter when it says uh, uh, the, the winter is over and the sound of the turtle is heard. Uh, that, that's talking about the turtle dove. You know, in the wintertime, I always, uh, every March, I start looking in the latter part of March or April, when I start seeing the dove, the uh, robins and the dove start coming out. Well, I know it's, I know that it's the winter's over. The, the birds are coming out and they're, uh, you know, they're start starting to feed on the, on the grass and the, you know, the, the insects and worms are all beginning to work in the soil. And, and so you'll see the birds come out. I, mean, I always like to see the cardinals and the blue jays and uh, again, the, the doves and uh, all, all facets of the, the species of the birds, uh, knowing that it's, it's uh, summertime. Well, in Paul's day, that was our early rain. That was God reigning on the Gentiles. And then the winter set in and, uh, you know, the church did fall away and went through a great uh, winter, great darkness, dark period. There wasn't any harvest back there. But uh, then in the latter part, in the 1500s, God began to raise up men right out of the Catholic Church, Martin Luther, who was a monk, 
uh, in the Catholic Church, men like Wycliffe and Huss, those men out of uh, the church back there, God began to deal with them and stir them up, and they began to get just little gleanings of life coming out of the Word of God that they had never seen before and that tradition hadn't been able to afford them the anointing that was God began to anoint that and God started the Reformation movement. There was uh, Martin Luther started that in 15, I believe it was in 1517 when he wrote his 95 theses on the um, uh, Wittenberg, Germany cathedral door on the uh, and showed 95 things that he had saw that they were missing or in error on concerning uh, concerning uh, their teaching. And, and that started uh, the Reformation. But I have always stated that it did not, it was not established. Martin Luther had to run for his life. There was a there was a, you know, a warrant out to kill him uh, as a heretic of the Catholic Church, and he God, but God did protect him, and uh, he he got what he got was is that the just shall live by faith, among other things. But that was his main message, and God anointed it, and people uh, began to have faith in the Word of God and in the teachings of Martin Luther uh, showing that there was a Christ that would forgive you of your sins. You could have faith in him and you could look to him. You did not have to pay any uh, pen, pence or you didn't have to uh, go through any rigmarole to get your sins forgiven. That if you came to God with a godly sorrow and came to the Lord and repented of your sins, he'd be faithful to forgive you. That was a great uh, a move of God back there, uh, and and the Lord started the the uh, a uh, reformation back there to begin to restore. Uh, he he began to restore that that was lost. Or that you know the the you might say just like in the winter time that it's too far from the sun for very much to be produced. But as the winter starts getting over and the earth starts getting closer to the sun, the, the wheat fields begin to flourish. They begin to grow. They stay real small up until then. But when the sun, when the earth gets closer to the sun, wheat begins to grow. And of course it grows up uh, at a certain height uh, till finally it's the height where it will begin to produce a harvest. And so it, it takes on time into May and June for uh, it to harvest in most places. But uh, this reformation was like that. We were getting closer to the sun. The, the wheat was getting more nutrition out of the earth and more heat from the sun, more uh uh, covering from the word of God, more anointing from the word of God uh, that was causing us to develop uh, in the restoration. Finally, uh, it was in 1539 when King Henry VIII declared himself to be head of the church and he pulled away from Catholicism and declared he was a head of the church in England. And uh, and there had been different little nations that would rise up from time to time in rebellion against Catholicism and, and Rome. But, uh, you know, this was pretty big when, when King Henry did this. And finally, in 1543, the Catholic Church started the anti-Reformation movement with the Jesuit priesthood. And uh, that's when I say that uh, the Reformation was established and the Catholic Church realized we got to do something about it. 
and began, they began to fight against it. But nothing could stop God in reforming. And, uh, you know, finally, uh, in the 1900s, uh, 1901, God introduced the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Topeka, Kansas, uh, furthering the Reformation. And then Azusa Street, by 1903, uh, Pentecostal movement was established in America. And uh, so uh, God called a man by the name of William Souders and uh, began to, you know what he told him? I want you to preach my gospel. Brother Souders at one time decided that he was uh, 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 you know, uh, he, you know, he, he couldn't hardly adjust himself. Uh, and, and he was preaching everything that he thought God gave him. You know, back in those days when God called somebody, they didn't have a lot of maturity. They didn't grow a whole lot. They just went by faith and God helped them. God had to do that in the beginning. God, God, he was working uh, in people's hearts, the spirit of God was moving on them and things were fresh and God was having men to speak uh, these fresh things that they were receiving of the Lord. Brother Saunders was a special chosen man and, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he began to preach what God gave him out of the word of God. But, you know, there are several friends of his that he became friends with who were other ministers. And they got on to him one day and told him, he said, you, you got to quit preaching some of the stuff you're preaching. And he said, why? And they said, because it's not altogether right. And he said, well, what's wrong with it? Well, they began to tell him. And so he wanted to be accepted. And so he started preaching things the way they were telling him it ought to be. And and when he did that, he lost his anointing. And he said, um, he began to pray. He said, God, why have you took my anointing away from me? What, what's happened? You know, I had such, uh, such an anointing, such, such a covering of the spirit of God when I would talk. And that's left me. What's happened? He began to pray. And God spoke to him one day and he said, I called you to preach my gospel and you're preaching man's gospel. And he began to pray and said, God, if you'll give me my anointing back, I'll preach it just exactly like you give it to me. And of course the God, what, what the Lord began to show him was, is primarily in the fourth chapter of Ephesians where it says there's one body and one faith and one spirit he got a revelation on the body of Christ. He began to look at that word and he began to realize that the body of Christ was like a human body. It was together in the New Testament church. It wasn't separated like all of these organizations that came out of uh, all of these uh, different movements. And God was in those things. God had to work in those things. God worked in the Catholic Church. That's where he got his reformers to come out of. And, uh, uh, and then they, they would just get, you know, they would just get what, what God gave them that was a revelation above what they had. And they would preach on that revelation. I don't think Martin Luther ever thought that Lutheranism are to be developed and turned into an organization uh, and using his name. I doubt seriously that that John and Charles, uh, 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 somebody help me with that. Uh, it's lost me. Uh, that that they they developed uh, that another organization the Methodists, the Wesley, John and Charles Wesley, excuse me for not coming up that, escaped my mind there for a minute, but the, it started out as a Wesleyan movement. Finally, it turned into the Methodist movement. 
And I don't think those men ever intended for an organization to de derive out of what they were doing, but, but that's all men knew to do. Uh, in fact, I have said that I believe that the Lord probably allowed and maybe even put it in the minds of, of those men back there to set up a democratic type order that wasn't God's order out of the New Testament. The New Testament order you won't find out here in these organizations. That's generally a democratic order, but the reason they set it up that way was to prevent a dictatorial order like the Catholic Church. So they set it up to where, you know, they voted men in, they voted men out, they set up trustees, they uh, set up uh, 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 a, a council that would, uh, you know, determine uh, their who their pastor was going to be, and and they could even fire him, uh, and that protected the people back then because they came out of such a dictatorial uh, system, and uh, God had to do something to protect, give the people some kind of protection while God was developing. Uh, a greater order, a greater restored order. And I think when Brother Souders began to realize that the body, the order of the body of Christ in the New Testament, um, he began to see, if you want to look with me in, the, in, in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, I'll say something here uh, that may be a little bit different than uh, maybe what you've heard before, but he first starts out telling, and he's, he's writing to the church at Ephesus, and he tells them to, in the first verse, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation. See, a vocation is, is a calling. Uh, that's the calling of God that God calls you to the body of Christ. And of course, primarily here, he's talking to a ministry, but the ministry is to carry this out to the church. And he tells them to, uh, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, to be low or humble and then meek, not weak, but meek that you have a yielding spirit, carefulness, and a long-suffering patience, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And that's to keep your spirit in unity with others. And Brother Souders taught us that. He taught us how to keep the right spirit while we're trying in the bond of peace to make peace with each other, even though we don't, we didn't come from the same place. We don't maybe believe the same thing. Brother Souders used to open up his services to all of God's people and all preachers. And he, he had an open pulpit and he allowed men, you know, most of us that's been around this has heard the story of how Brother Souders would, you know, a man would get up and preach and, and uh, it'd be a, a uh, uh, maybe a Trinitarian brother. And then he'd have a, a, maybe a oneness brother sitting next to him, one that believed in one in the Godhead, and maybe one that believed in the Trinity on the other side of him. And, and, and the, maybe the Trinitarian would get up and preach and the oneness would say, you know, he'd get mad and his, the blood vessels would pop out in his neck and he'd say, that's a lie, it's not true. And, Brother Satter said, brother, let's listen to him. He has to have a reason for believing this. He said, when he gets done, you can talk. And he'd reach in his pocket and pull out an apple and cut it in half and give it to the brother sitting next to him and try to keep him calm long enough for this brother to talk. And then he'd let that brother get up and talk. Then he'd have to give the other half an apple to the other brother and try to keep him calm. He would try to work peace among these brothers and, uh, and he would tell them to, you know, that there's just one body. That early church just had one body and one spirit. 
even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in you all. All right, then look at this verse seven. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. That grace that was given was given to a ministry in five gifts. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Uh, see, uh, and verse 11 said he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Or let's use that word perfecting for the finishing, for the maturity of the saints, for the work of the ministry. This ministry was to cause the people of God to come to a fullness in righteousness or a mature state of, well, let's read what he says here and he explains it. Uh, this ministry was for the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. See, even in the body of Christ, we can't claim that right now. We are not in unity of the faith. We're working on it. We're still in this reformation period. We're still restoring the church. God still has us building, uh, working on the building. There's still two women grinding at the mill, the millstone. You know, that was a, a a stone that worked inside of a stone bowl. You put uh, wheat in there and would grind it into powder to make wheat flour out of to make bread. That was a picture. Two women. There's two women. There's the true church and the false church. The Bible is basically talking to two women, two women grinding at the mill. Uh, and in the end of this, one will be taken, the other be left. The only thing left will be, you know, what they taught me in, out in Babylon when I was out there among the uh, organizations. They taught me that the one to be taken would be that God's people would go up in the rapture. But in here, they taught me, no, the one that's taken will be taken out of the way in judgment. And the only thing left will be the true church. God will judge that other system. God will take the other system out in judgment. And God will, what will remain will his, be his people and his true church. Um, Till we all come in the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man or a fully uh, matured saint of God, individual, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, that fullness is that finished work. Uh why? That you henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about and ever wind to doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. See, everybody's trying to, I, I even think here in the body of Christ, we should be careful about being emphatic about what we're teaching if we're not, if it's something that this brotherhood is not together on. I think we are to teach our people. We should, we should, uh, we, we can't teach something that we don't see or we don't, you know, we have to teach our position on it. But I always try to tell the people here in Little Rock, you know, if we're not, I try to tell them other, what other men, uh, there's another side to this. I'm teaching you my position but, uh, you know, we may have to change. God may, I have changed on some things. God's changed me on some things. Um, the, the book of Revelation right now is, is becoming uh, very much alive to me. God's showing me several things that I've, I've, I've been going to write a book on it. In fact, I've been working on it for a couple of years. Uh, 
but I can't ever get to a place where I get it completely finished. Before I get it finished, God gives me a change. <laughs> the Lord gives me an adjustment. I have to make an adjustment. I just talked uh, last weekend on the seven heads in, in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation that uh, had uh, John saw a, a beast. He's standing on the sea. Uh, he saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Well, it you know I begin to look at that. I begin to realize here there's seven heads. Uh, this beast had seven heads and ten horns, and it came up out of the sea. And I begin to look at how to explain that. How to explain this? head that came up out of the earth that's part of the seven before it's over with but it didn't come up out of the sea it came up out of the earth and God gave me a different understanding on that realizing that uh, this beast that came up out of the earth originated out of the earth it had two horns like a lamb it it's a it's it's so it's a it originated out of the earth, but by the time it spake as a dragon and exercised all the uh, power of the beast that was before it, it became part of the system of the world, and it did be it did evolve into a dragon right out of the world. I, I see that beast coming up out of the earth as being the United States of America. By the way, let me say something about that. Brother, uh, Brother Souter's got several things that we have out of the book of Revelation. Where he got that from was from a man by the name of Uriah Smith uh, way back in the 1800s that God touched this man's mind and he wrote a book on the Dan on Daniel and the Revelation. And there are several things he didn't understand about the, the harvest. He didn't understand about uh, the second heaven condition and some things in prophecy. But God gave this man quite a bit of understanding that Brother Souders received uh, quite a bit from. And by the way, Uriah Smith did see that the United States was uh, in prophecy and that it was that beast that rose up out of the earth. Uh, I think he had that right. I think by the time, you see, America's turned on God. America evolved out of, not out of the sea of humanity or the world, but it evolved out of our forefathers' religion. It evolved out of, uh, God's reformation. The United States of America is the heart of what God restored and was finally ready to begin to call people out into one body with the message that he gave Brother William Souders. That evolved out of the earth, not out of the sea. The earth there in the book of Revelation represents religion. And uh, so... Uh, but by the time you see America now, even though it may have started out with two horns like a lamb, a civil power and a religious power, separation of church and state, those powers were separated uh, by our forefathers who were God-fearing men that came to this country to have freedom of religion and to build a country that would not dictate to God's church. And they wanted that kept out of the, the power of the state so that God could work on his church in the way that he saw fit. But America has lost their connection with God. America has turned away from God. Uh, you know, the psalmist said that a nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. That's a hellish condition. That's a, And, and uh, by the time America... Uh, speaks as a dragon, it will have become part of the system and join back up with that harlot system and and make 
an image to that system before it's over with. So it does become a part of the seven. It does become a part of the uh, the world. It takes on the worldliness. It's no longer one nation under God. They take on any kind of God, any kind of belief about any kind of anything. And so, but I, I know that God chose America the way he did. It, it will only uh, be in power for a short space because it will not last a long time. Once it makes an image to the beast, once it speaks as a dragon, makes that image, it will give its power to the beast. I don't know that it'll intend for the beast to get all the power from it, but it will. But anyway, uh, that's an adjustment that God had to give me, uh, an, it, at least in a greater explanation of those seven, uh, that beast that rose up out of the sea that had seven heads and 10 horns. This beast came out of the sea and that beast had seven heads. Now I know many of those beasts heads was before it. And, uh, you know, five of them had fallen, one was, but they still all came up out of the sea. You can't see that it, they didn't come up out of religion. They come up out of the world and America will evolve into that in the end, but it's its beginning came up out of the earth. That's how it rose up before it finally became a part of the world system. Anyway, there are several things that I'm seeing that in that book that I'm getting some uh, adjustments, uh, greater understanding, better way to explain certain things. Anyway, uh, God is going to harvest a harvest in the end of this world. And don't get discouraged because we're going through. I mentioned uh, here recently that, you know, we we went to meetings. I've been here for way, you know, uh, what, 43 years or among the body of Christ. And, and I've went to meetings, meetings and meetings and come home and gather what nugget we could get in those meetings or what few nuggets. Sometimes you'd wonder if you got a nugget, but we would, we worked on it. We labored at it. And many times we heard a lot of things we'd have to sort through to find out where was the nugget that God gave us or the, you know, what few nuggets we could get. But look, saints, they're, uh, be encouraged because this, bo this body, we all believe in one body. We all believe in a ministry that'll speak the same thing in a restored church. We all believe in uh, the Godhead alike. We all believe in hell alike. We all believe in a restored church in the end of this world. We all believe in a harvest in the end of this world. We all believe in life uh, eternal. We all believe in the bride of Jesus Christ. And I, when I say we all, I'm talking about the the, the core, the heart, the center core. Uh, there's always new people coming in that has to adapt and begin to learn some of these things, but God has wrought a work among us that is tremendous. And we have a tremendous vision of what God's going to do in the end of this world, and there's Bible, plenty of Bible to show that God's going to accomplish it. As I said, the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation is all talking about a harvest in the end of the Gentile world. Well, I didn't even get close to what I wanted to talk about tonight. I got I got a little bit off on this other, but uh, uh, just remember, there's going to be a harvest. And it will be, look, the Lord had patience for the precious fruit of the early and latter reign of the Jewish world. The law and the prophets, that was the, their early reign. Their latter reign was came on the day of Pentecost and carried them through to the end of the Feast of Tabernacles where they were to uh, rejoice for the harvest of that, that spiritual harvest that came upon them uh, by the end of their time, when God finished that harvest, 
They were in the Feast of Tabernacles. They were rejoicing in what God had done. Of course, you weren't rejoicing if you wasn't in the body of Christ, but if you was in the body of Christ, you was rejoicing because of what God had done. Uh, even in the seven, the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, that was in the very end, that was still in a sevenfold light. There were still seven candlesticks there. God was, he was correcting some things to those churches, but he was also admonishing them. And he was giving them a promise and letting them know you still have time. These candlesticks are still burning. Uh, there's still a sevenfold light, a full manifestation of the truth of the word of God that you can adhere to. God, God, uh, I mean, he held on to everything he could hold on to in that harvest. And there were many Gentiles and many Jews also in those churches that was in Asia. And God finished, some of them finished their work promises were left to them that they could finish their work before finally the lights went out, before God finally, uh, you know, uh, and then if you read over in the book of Revelation in the 18th chapter, there is a scripture that says, the light of the candle shall be shown no more, seen no more at all in her. That's not talking about a seven-fold lighted candlestick like they're like I'm talking about in the seven churches. They had a candle. We have we don't have a seven-fold light today, but we it seems like from time to time we get a flickering of of maybe a, a greater light, a greater understanding of what God's reforming. And before it's over with, God will give us that seven-fold light will be added back. And so uh, we're we're laboring, you know. We're laboring to get into that place that those seven churches were in uh, before the church completely fell away, and then we'll come in into a full sevenfold light. Finally, the Son of God will, you know, he come out of his chamber like a bride uh, groom seeking for his bride. The sun will stand right up over us in judgment, and there will be no uh, variableness nor shadow of turning. Right now, you know, God's shining a light on us, but there's a shadow. You know, wherever God's not shining his light on you yet, you're making a shadow. And uh, that's an area that God's not shining over you. But when the sun gets right up over you, see, when, when the Lord comes in full judgment to you and the, the sun uh, covers you. And there is no matter where you turn, there's no shadow. God, uh, God will shine his light all over you. We have that song, shine your light all around me. That ought to be our prayer. God help us to know all your will to, that you would perfect or finish your work. That word perfect means to finish. It means to come to a completeness, a finished work of God that he'd finish his righteousness. And you can't get that finished uh, without uh, and believe a lie. You can't, but we, we, brother, we need to pray for one another that God would help us to come together on the word of God and, uh, whatever. I'm, I've been examining myself. God, is there any way I could look at this another way? I'm, I'm trying to look at the book of Revelation like, you know, some brethren believe that the seven trumpets are down through the thousand years. I've tried to examine that. God, is there any way I can, is that, would that be right if I'm that far off? Uh, you know, so I'm trying my best. God, show me if there's anywhere where I'm wrong. Of course, I don't believe that. That's not, I don't see that that way. But I am seeing how some of those men could see that. I'm starting to, you know, I never even really considered them. But I've listened, I've, I've looked at it, and I've seen, but, but I think when we, you know, here's our problem. If we don't stay in the context of scriptures, and we pick a scripture here and then go over here and pick a scripture and we can make the Bible say what we want it to say. 
But if God can help us to get the spirit of the writer, the spirit of the God that gave the writer, the holy man of old, that spake as the Holy Ghost moved upon them. If we can get what God was saying to the church through his ministry, and God can, and he will, saints have faith and believe that God will, right now you need to, you need to be faithful to your pastor. You need to be obedient and you need to uh, uh, work in order and uh, God will honor you for that. And us, this ministry, we have to work in order with what God is working among us. And we have to stay together. We've got to stay together. We got to work peace. We got to seek peace. Uh, and uh, we have to work peace among one another. Blessed are the peacemakers. Praise God. So don't get discouraged. There is a harvest coming and there's a restored church coming, but you can rejoice today in all of the great things that God has given us and the truths that God has wrought among us. So uh, I just want to leave you with encouragement. Uh, shake, shake this uh, COVID-19 uh, despair. I know we're all getting, you know, like, a fever with it. We're getting tired of it. But just, you know, just look up and ask God to help you and begin to rejoice for the things that God has done for you. What God has, every once in a while, you need to just stop and remember where God brought you from and what God's done in your life. And uh, and we need to trust him for all that's going on. What's He's in charge don't think for a moment that God's not in charge. No one has snuck up on God. He's not unawares of anything. He's in full control. You can trust him. Praise God. Anyway, uh, remember to pray for, I know the McAllister Church has had several cases with COVID in it. Sister uh, Weiser, pray for her. She's been in the hospital. I haven't heard today, but uh, I heard that she was not doing well at all. And then I did hear a ray of hope that she may have had a little bit of improving. Uh, Sister Diane Suttmiller, of course, is, is uh, in my family and with Brother Steve Suttmiller's wife, pray for her. She's still in the hospital in Ada, Oklahoma. Uh, Brother and Sister Walker in, in Lakeland, Florida, pastors of, of the church there. Uh, both have COVID. I think Sister Walker's doing, uh, coming out of it, not had near as bad a case, but Brother Walker, I haven't heard about him today. He did go, I think, had the uh, plasma blood transfusion. So I'm hoping that that has improved. He's improved with that. Keep them in your prayers. Uh, pray for us. Keep praying for the body of Christ. Look up. Look to the hills from whence cometh your help. Your help comes from the Lord. Don't look to the world. What's going on in the world isn't for the people of God. It's not for the people of God. God's protection, God's promise, God's hand on your life. That's what we need to be concerned about in the body of Christ. Don't get all up in the air about all these poly all this is politics. God removes kings and he sets up kings. It's not always good for a nation. Sometimes God even chooses wicked kings for wicked people. That's not part of the church. Jesus told the disciples, you're not of this world. Uh, you're in this world, but you're not of it. And he prayed that the father would keep them. And then he even prayed for us, those that hear them, <laughs> his ministry that maybe wasn't back there with them, but he prayed for those that were affected by his ministry and the good word of God. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ. Principles are rules. There has to be rules to keep your flesh under while God works his workmanship in you. God, there has you have to keep the flesh down. 
Now you, you can't get perfected by rules. And doctrine means sayings. That that was spoken, the spoken word, his spoken words, which was his teaching. Uh, uh, till we, let us go on. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Uh, so we've got to go on to this maturity, this fullness of righteousness that God will work in us if we'll be faithful. Let me give you this in closing, that if you be faithful in God, that's all you can do. He will be faithful to take you the rest of the way. Just keep being faithful. They that followed them in the hymn in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation were called, chosen, and faithful. I've always said, as long as you say yes, you quit being called, you start being faithful. As long as you say yes to the voice of the Lord. And as long as you say yes, I mean, you'll be chosen. And as long as you continue to say yes, you'll remain faithful. If you ever say, no, Lord, I can't do that, you'll just go back to being called. Just keep saying yes. Say, Lord, I, you have to help me. But if you'll help me, I'll obey you, Lord. Praise God. All right, God bless your hearts. Have a good night. I'll talk to you here locally at the church Sunday morning in our Bible study at uh, breakfast at 930, 10 o'clock Bible study, service at 1130. We'll see you then. Until then, God bless you. Pray for me, and I'll pray for you. God bless your hearts. Good night.